Okay, so <laughs> let's start again. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to the Central Asia Program. My name is Sebastian Perus. I'm the director of the Central Asia Program here at George Washington University. So uh, we are at a time, of course, where for at least a decade when all the planet has been talking about uh, the issue of climate change. And I, as I was saying, maybe especially now, uh, with the uh, COP28 uh, happening in Dubai. So today we're going to address an extremely important and sensitive topic for Central Asia and uh, for the world, which is the RLC. Uh, the RLC used to be actually, the, if I'm not mistaken, the fourth largest lake in the world. And unfortunately, a major part of it has disappeared uh, over the last, uh, in the past six decades, due to starvation of its main water uh, resources for irrigation and for other purposes. So this has resulted in a massive environmental, social, and economic catastrophe. It has affected uh, millions of people uh, and ecosystems in the region, but also beyond the region. And the RLC uh, crisis has been widely regard regarded as one of the worst uh, human-made disasters in history. And it's a stark example of the consequences of unsustainable water management and development. But the RLC crisis is not only a tragic story of the past, but it's also a relevant and urgent lesson for the present and the future. Uh, and as the world faces uh, many challenges and risks of climate change and water scarcity, the RLC crisis offers, uh, I think, really valuable insights and experiences on how to prevent, to mitigate, and to adapt to similar situations in other regions uh, in the world and other contexts. So the RLC also highlights the need and the opportunity for a regional and international cooperation and innovation to address the complex and uh, interrelated issues of water, energy, uh, food, and security. So to explore these topics, including the imperative to draw uh, insightful comparisons with other lakes worldwide, which are facing uh, desiccation too, uh, we have five uh, uh, excellent ex uh, speakers today. As all those experts are authorities in the field of environmental uh, environmental issue, each will bring you know, unique insight to enrich our understanding of the challenges posed by the shrinking bodies of water. We will have Sarah Cameron, Kate Shield, Zauresh Alimbietova, Elizabeth Price, and Wilder uh, Alejandro Sanchez. But before the, their presentation, we are uh, very, very privileged today to have the Deputy Chief of Mission of the Embassy of Kazakhstan uh, uh, to the United States, Mr. Rawan Tleulin, who is going to give us some uh, introductory uh, remarks. So I would like also to thank the Embassy of Kazakhstan for organizing this event today. We really, uh, really appreciate to, uh, for their work on this very uh, important topic. So Mr. Tleulin, the floor is yours. Thank you. Dear ladies and gentlemen, esteemed guests, thank you all for joining this timely discussion on the RLC crisis and its far-reaching implication not only for Kazakhstan and Central Asia, but the world. I would like to thank Ms. Sarah Cameron for her remarkable dedication to raising awareness about the RLC crisis. I am grateful to the Mr. Pirus and GW Central Asian Program for supporting and organizing this event, allowing us to gather for this important dialogue. Despite numerous efforts to revive the RLC, the area continues to experience significant environmental damage, leading to serious social and economic issues. Approximately 40 million people resident in the RLC basin are now at risk due to the sea shrinking. Recognizing the to the extent of these shared challenges, addressing the world leaders at COP28 in Dubai last week, President Tokayev highlighted the importance of mobilizing global actions to support the International Fund for Saving the RLC and convened a regional climate summit in 2026 under the UN auspices. This year marks the 30th anniversary of the establishment of the fund, which during the past three decades has done much work in tackling this problem. Next year, 
Kazakhstan will assume the chairmanship of the fund and we are fortunate to have the fund representative with us today. We are like islands in the sea, separate on the surface but connected in the deep. The famous American philosopher William James said once, in our seemingly vast world, it's easy to think that what happens on one side of the Atlantic does not affect the other. However, recent years have shown us just how interconnected and interdependent we are. The main lesson that the RLC imparts to us is the profound value of water. This critical resource, which sustains life, ecosystem, economies, is poised to eclipse the importance of oil in the forthcoming centuries. Nowadays, global challenges require joint actions and resources. Political resolve and public awareness are, ne are necessary, but action is crucial in implementing effective solutions. Since Jane independence, Kazakhstan has devoted considerable attention to climate change and water-related challenges. We recognize the urgency of the climate crisis as one of the existential threats that take global and take global commitment seriously. Kazakhstan has ratified the Paris Agreement, adopted a carbon neutrality strategy for 2060, and fully supports UN's urgent call for tangible actions to safeguard our environment for future generations. Building over 30 years of successful partnership, Kazakhstan and the United States show how these efforts have transformed into real actions. From the New York Declaration adopted by C5 plus one leaders, the USAID expedition to the dried bottom of the Aral Sea, 1.5 billion joint statement on the global methane pledge approved by Kazakh and American climate envoys last week, to name just a few. The security of Central Asia is jeopardized by the global impacts of climate change, the advent of the dry season, and the adequacy of irrigation water. Kazakhstan faces unique challenges stemming from the crisis. The impacts of the crisis go beyond environmental degradation and the territory of the one country. They have far-reaching consequences on livelihoods, economies, and regional stability. In this regard, international cooperation is paramount. With this in mind, I'm sure that we can do much more. The first step would be to support academic research like Ms. Cameron's to enhance understanding of the problem. We appreciate USAID's efforts in the environmental restoration of the Aral Sea activity to improve the resilience of landscape in the Northern Aral Sea zone. In line with this, at the second step, we could create the Kazakhstan-US Aral Task Force that we, can, that we can launch next year, involving our respective agencies and in the, engaging our national development institutions like Kazate and USAID. The task force could identify the priorities we can work on, ranging from the tackling environmental issues to improving access to water and mitigating public health concerns. As we engage in this discussion, let us commit ourselves to the lessons learned from the RLC. Let us pledge to champion sustainable water management, force the international collaboration, and harness the power of innovation to address the urgent challenges posed by today's climate crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for this very uh, important introductory remarks. So we are now moved to our uh, speakers. Uh, and we're going to start with uh, Mrs. Sarah Cameron, who first I would like to thank her because she also contributed a lot to organizing this, uh, to organize this event. And uh, she's an associate professor of history at the University of Maryland, College Park. At present, she's at work on, uh, she's working on a book, a manuscript entitled Ara, Life and Death of the Sea. Uh, in 2022, Professor Cameron was named an Andrew Carnegie Fellow and funds from the Carnegie, Carnegie Corporation will support her research on the RLC. And she's also and she's the also author of the, the uh, very, very famous, famous and excellent, excellent book, The Hungry State Famine, Violence and the Making of Solid Kazakhstan, which was published in 2018 by Cornell University Press. 
And this book examines a little known crime of the Stalinist regime, which is a Kazakh famine of the 1930s. Uh, and this book, uh, for very good reasons, uh, <laughs> won many awards in the United States and it uh, also provoked intense discussion in Kazakhstan, where well, the famine remains a sensitive topic and all due to Kazakhstan's close relationship with uh, Russia. So, Sarah, thank you so much for being with us today, for everything you did, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sebastian. I, I appreciate that very kind in, uh, introduction. Uh, distinguished colleagues and honored guests, uh, I'm really pleased to speak to you today at this important event. Uh, I'm a historian, as was mentioned. I'm working on a book about the causes and consequences of the Errol Sea's demise. Uh, I have had an opportunity actually twice this summer uh, to visit the Aral Sea, the Kazakhstani side, uh, including Aralsk and some of the surrounding regions. Um, I've also conducted a lot of research in different archives to study this problem. I've spent a lot of time doing oral history uh, interviews. I'm hoping uh, to go to Turkmenistan in January and then uh, in Uzbekistan in the spring, continuing uh, my research on this on this problem, which is really a transboundary problem, as my remarks will make clear. Through my writing, I hope to bring greater global attention to the problem of the Aral Sea. As the event description indicates, in the West, the Aral Sea was long framed as a Soviet story, a disaster exclusively caused by the communist politics of the Soviet regime, and one that could not be replicable anywhere else. Such a framing, I argue, had very unfortunate consequences. At the most basic level, it meant that international attention largely turned away from the Aral Sea a decade or so ago, a, a decade or so after the Cold War was over. You can really see this in the number of scientific studies. They begin to decline, international attention focused elsewhere. People in the West at least believed that the issue was over and resolved. But of course, we who study the region, um, those of you who live in the region, we understand this is not true on many different levels. And also, if we look globally now, if, even if we just take the example of the United States, we have so many examples of shrinking bodies of water. Those include the Great Salt Lake, Lake Mead, and the Salton Sea. And actually, what is very interesting is the patterns that we see in these disasters closely resemble the Aral Sea disaster. They include things like rising salinity, increased dust storms, the die off of certain fish and animal species and dramatic climate changes. Those who live near these bodies have also experienced an increase in medical problems. And this is yet another pattern that closely resembles the Aral Sea disaster. Rather than sectioning off the Aral Sea disaster as something unique, something we can consign to the distant past, something that's over, I argue it's far more important to think about what we can actually learn from this. The Aral Sea disaster is in many ways a harbinger of our own future, particularly that is particularly true because the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has predicted that Central Asia is actually going to be at the forefront of climate change in the future. Uh, by that, I mean that the Aral Sea and the region more generally will warm faster than the rest of the globe. In that spirit, I want to offer to you three thoughts about what we can learn from this disaster. The first lesson is that the Aral Sea case illustrates that water is a transboundary issue. Water does not respect political boundaries. By necessity, dealing with water scarcity requires cooperation across regional, state, or national lines. The Aral Sea is an excellent illustration of this point. For most of the Soviet period, the Aral Sea was, of course, divided between two republics, Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. When the water began to retreat in the 1960s, the disaster affected a region generally known as the Priyaral, or the lands around the Aral Sea. That's a territory that includes parts of Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and Turkmenistan. The people who were affected by this disaster are not defined by nationality. From the very beginning then, resolving this crisis has required cooperation across national lines. And that's particularly true, of course, if you look at a map and you look at the way the water flows into the sea, the Amu Darya and Sir Darya, of course, cross several other countries. Choices made upstream can affect the fate of the communities that depend upon the sea. National cooperation on the issue of the Aral Sea has not always been easy. Water is a really scarce resource in this region, but there have been some notable successes. Uh, I, of course, point out uh, the organization that's already been mentioned, the International Fund for Saving the Aral Sea, which was uh, founded in 1993. This organization celebrated its 30th anniversary this year. 
and it has been really instrumental in facilitating cooperation on water issues across national lines. On the more basic level of people-to-people -people diplomacy, I'd also like to single out the work of the Kazakh German University. They run an RLC summer school every year. I had the privilege of participating in it this year as an instructor. They take young water professionals from all across Central Asia and Afghanistan, all around the RLC. Uh, and this organization, I think, plays a really vital role in getting young people from different nationalities talking to each other and thinking pragmatically about how to resolve this crisis. Uh, so that's the first kind of lesson I think uh, we can draw from it. Uh, point two that I'd like to discuss is that shrinking lakes and seas are not just environmental crises, they are human crises. Put another way, it's not just that bodies of water are, are receding, it's that people's lives are being dramatically altered, changed, and disrupted. In the case of the Earl Sea, for instance, Western media tend to, tended to focus on dramatic satellite time series photos of the sea retreating, neglecting the really important effect of the sea's retreat on people's livelihood and culture. As I'm sure um, uh, my colleague Kate Shield and my colleague Kate Shield has stressed, um, the visual effect of this was actually, you know, to focus on all these time series photos was to present the region as a place without people. But of course, we know that this was not true. The collapse of the fishing industry had really profound effects on people's culture and way of life. There was and still is immense human migration induced by this disaster. Uh, many people have left the Priaral in huge numbers. Uh, some have returned, although others have remained where they fled. You need only actually look at literature or culture, I would argue, to understand the sweep, the, the really big sweep of this crisis. Uh, a number of actually very distinguished Central Asian authors come to mind, uh, particularly Chinggis Aitmatov, who wrote about the Aral Sea in a day last more than 100 years. Uh, but we might also think of many other authors like um, Abdid Jamil Nurpesov, Roland Sesenbayev, and Tula Perken Kaipergenov. So there's an enormous, um, the Aral Sea is, is really uh, uh, broadly discussed in literature and the arts. As we think about how to respond to these new climate crises, the retreat of the Salton Sea, the shrinking of the Great Salt Lake, we should take care that we don't just reduce them to environmental disasters. We cannot neglect that these are disasters that are at once human and environmental. We need hydrologists and geoscientists to understand where the water went and how it might be restored. But we also need social workers or economists to help people cope with the cultural and economic upheavals that these disasters produce. And here again, I think there are lessons and examples that we can take from the Errol Sea case. In places where fishing was not possible, some have turned to camel breeding. This has proven to be a very lucrative industry in some parts. In other cases, important civic groups have sprung up. Here I'm thinking of the wonderful NGO, Aral Teneze, on the uh, Kazakhstani side, uh, who has provided a lot of important assistance to groups still struggling with the effects of these disasters. Uh, the third and final point that I'd like to make is that the question of disaster relief, what is sometimes called restoration in the case of uh, the RLC, um, the USAID, for instance, has a, a project to uh, restore restoration of the RLC basin, that this is a very challenging and difficult question. There has been really amazing work done to mitigate the effects of the Aral Sea crisis. Uh, this includes afforestation. By that, I mean the planting of trees, the planting of saksaul trees. Um, in the Soviet period, uh, as the disaster began, there were also efforts to mitigate uh, the crisis. They introduced salt tolerant fish because the salinity of the sea was growing up. So they introduced a flounder among other species of fish. Uh, and then of course, uh, very notably in the post-Soviet era, the World Bank constructed a dam on the Kazakhstani side of the sea in 2005. But these restoration, or uh, as I'll, I'll discuss, I think it might be better to speak of rehabilitation efforts, um, raise a lot of questions about when we can say this crisis has ended. Uh, and also what restoration, if we use that term of the landscape, might look like and who gets a say in that choice. Um, these are very difficult questions in part because climate change is complicating ongoing relief efforts. As I mentioned, Central Asia is one of the world regions most exposed to climate change. Uh, when I was in um, the Aral Sea region this summer on the Kazakhstani side, 
people told me that the salinity of the sea is going up and the water flow is going down. The idea of restoration also somehow implies that the sea's levels were stable prior to the sea's post-1960 retreat, that is the modern retreat of the sea. But we know that the sea's levels have actually fluctuated dramatically over the course of its history. This is something uh, that's also true if we look at the sea's deep past. And this is something that my uh, colleague in archeology, span Professor Liz Bright might also tell us more about. Environmental instability is actually a feature of the dry lands more generally. These places are rarely stable, rarely at equilibrium. So in thinking about the Aral Sea case, one lesson we might uh, draw is that it's important to clearly define what landscape restoration means and kind of not idealize a pristine past when these places were always stable. In fact, it might be better even to think about rehabilitation rather than restoration. Uh, restoration implies perhaps that you're putting it back exactly what you had before but um, rehabilitation has a different uh, meaning. Another lesson is that it's important to understand who gets a say in this choice of rehabilitation or restoration. When I was in the Aral Sea region this summer, I heard many different visions of what people wanted to happen. Uh, these choices often entail kind of competing desires, competing imperatives, and they're often not easy. But overall, I want to close with a message of hope. Um, my visits to the Aral Sea region this summer left me actually um, stunned by how beautiful it is. I was really unprepared for that. The really beautiful um, fiery sunsets when I was there, actually the, all the tam, um, tamarisk plants were in bloom. So there are these gorgeous kind of uh, purple uh, flowers all over the region. It's really a strikingly beautiful place. I encourage all of you to visit. Um, but more broadly, I was also really hopeful uh, by the energy and enthusiasm of the people I met, uh, the interest in the international collaboration and knowledge exchange. Uh, this is the type of attitude, I believe, that will help us address these crises in the future. Thank you. So, um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, uh, to the, the organizers, thank you very much for including me in this session. I'm, I'm delighted to be here virtually. I wish I could be uh, there in person with you all um, because I think this is a is a really important topic and we um, around the world have much to learn from the people, the plants, the animals and the lands and the water of the Aral Sea region. Um, so my experience is largely in Uzbekistan. Um, I have visited Aralsk in the northern uh, Aral Sea, but most of my time has been in Karakal, Pakistan, uh, based in Nukus, as well as some time in Horazm, so in the Amudaryo Delta. Um, so the photo on the right here is one that I took at the dam that marks the end of the Amudaryo uh, River currently. Um, and I think the beauty of this scene, the spectacular foliage of this Euphrates poplar uh, as it's turning yellow in November at sunset, um, provides an alternate visual to as Sarah described, the satellite images of the shrinking sea um, and to the approach that I take in my work, which I, I call seeing um, beyond catastrophe. So like Sarah, today I'd like to focus on what I see are three key lessons of the Aral Sea as we think about climate change. Um, and there is some some overlap here with Sarah, actually. I think we um, uh, think similarly in, in many ways. So um, the first is the power of place. The second is this question of uh, restoration that I'm going to focus on this question of, of baselines. Um, and then to, to think about how we um, sort of see to the people of this region um, to create meaningful change. Um, so first I wanna uh, think about the power of place. I'm a trained human environment geographer. So place is something I already think about a lot, um, but doing field work in the Aral Sea region has really emphasized this for me. So I want to start here with a story from my field work. As Arslan drives, he tells me that he loves horses, that he has been riding since he was five years old. We arrive at a sandy area with ridges on both sides, one ridge paralleling the collector or drainage canal. Oop. Uh, there are some native shrubs in the area, but it is largely open. We park over the bridge across the collector, and when we walk past, we see that beneath the bridge, there are goats. Arslan tells me that I can stay in the car, but I decline. We are here so that Arslan can join a game called Uluk. This game is being sponsored by a local, local family to celebrate their son's circumcision. After putting me in the care of an older man, Arslan goes to find the horse he has been led for the day. There are two teams, all on horseback, and the goal is to capture a goat that has been stuffed with salt. 
and get it to a designated place, uh, something I can only explain as perhaps similar to capture the flag. As the horses thunder back, they leave a cloud of dust behind them. Prizes are awarded for different rounds. They start at 100,000 Uzbek som, about 10 US dollars, and go up to a cow. After the thunder of horse hooves, the head of the family, dressed in a ceremonial robe and hat, comes over to meet me in a deeply accented karakalpak. He thanks me for joining their celebration and tells me that there is not enough water here. So this story highlights two things for me. First, how despite the environmental transformation of the Aral Sea region, residents continue to celebrate, play games, and carry on traditions passed from generation to generation in this place. Second, that despite this continuity, that the environment is never out of mind, but always present in the lives of residents. So yes, as we've talked about, the Aral Sea region has had enormous change in the past 60 years, but this is still a place that's valued by its residents. So as one person I interviewed told me, people in Karakal, Pakistan don't want to leave. They're really proud of their homeland. It's really important to them, and they're not going anywhere. I want to stay in Horazm. Unless you paid me, I think, $10,000 a year, I'm not leaving Horazm. So I commented to her that foreigners don't really get that. And she responded that even in even the people in Tashkent, which is the capital of Uzbekistan, don't really understand why people would want to continue to stay in this place. They only see the ecological disaster and they don't see beyond that. So as I've argued, we must see beyond this catastrophe um, and we must understand sort of the reasons and the value of the place of the Aral Sea region to the people who live there. So I think also in the context of climate change, this example of the enduring power of place despite huge change is important. So uh, the waves of climate migrants that were predicted have not emerged. Um, there were lots and lots of fears and rhetoric around this. And I, as well as other scholars, argue that these fears of climate migration broadly are overblown. So people want to stay in their places. And we know that some people can't stay in their places and they do migrate, as Sarah has, has told us. Uh, but I would argue that our work should be focused on helping people to do what they want to do, which is to stay in their places. So this means continuing to push for climate mitigation. For people to stay in their places, we must continue to advocate for a 1.5 or 2 degree uh, scenario. We know that even if we agree, sort of achieve at best case scenario, 1.5 degree world, 1.5 degree change, there will be changes broadly, and as we've heard, particularly in Central Asia. So part of helping people stay in their places is to both um, do a lot of work in climate change adaptation, as well as to build adaptive cap capacity and resilience. So one component of resilience is living within a functioning ecosystem, which brings me to my second lesson of how we think about ecosystem restoration uh, or the many ways we can talk about it. So hopefully I'm not spoiling uh, Liz's, Liz's thunder, um, but I wanna think, how do we think about the baselines for eco ecosystem restoration? What do we choose? So often within the science and practice of restoration ecology, the goal is to return a place to a historical baseline. So in the Aral Sea region of Uzbekistan, this is often thought to be 1960, but I would argue, at least from the Uzbek side, that it's clear that there is no return to a 1960 baseline, at least in my lifetime. So what then should be the baseline? So the graph or chart here shows the lake level over time and the salinity of the Aral Sea. So in the far left column, you can see dates. Um, at the top is present. Um, or when this was published at present in 2006, at the bottom is about 2000 years ago. Um, in so the um, third column from the right, you can see salinity changes. And then the far column on the right, you can see the lake level um, with high levels on the right-hand side of the column and low levels on the, on the left-hand side. And the details here um, are fascinating, but not as important for my, my point here. Um, what I want to, to show in a graph, as, as Sarah mentioned in words, is the, the dramatic changes in the level of the Aral Sea um, over, over time. So this indicates that there are several places that we could identify as a baseline, depending on how far back we wanted to go in time. But should we be focusing on restoring ecosystems to a predetermined baseline at all? Um, and as Sarah said, in the context of climate change, is this even possible? So as two... Uh, very well-known restoration ecologist Hobbs and Harris articulated more than 20 years ago, quote, if we change the focus of restoration from trying to recreate something from the past to trying to repair damage and create uh, creating systems which fulfill sensible goals, we will go a long way to solving many of the conundrums faced by this uh, facing the science and practice of re uh, restoration ecology. 
So initiatives in the Aral Sea region, including afforestation of the dry seabed, creation of honey gardens on the dried seabed and others, show how we can move away from chasing an impossible baseline to creating what um, restoration ecologists call novel ecosystems, which provide habitat for animals and plants and ecosystem services for humans. So I would say ecosystem restoration in the Aral Sea region also must extend to the Surin Amadario deltas. Um, which is where most of the people live. And this crucially in includes restoration of the Tugai or riparian forest, 90% um, of which in the Amudaria Delta uh, has, has died. Um, and in comparison to the spectacular decline of the Aral Sea itself, um, this decline of, of forest is um, uh, poorly uh, documented and uh, known from people outside the region. So a map here of, of the lakes, um, saline lakes have, which have declined. So with climate change and other causes of environmental degradation, this lesson of the need to repair damage and to focus on restoration that fulfills sensible goals is one that can and should be applied in other places in the world, including but not limited to other sea lion lakes, which you can see in the map. So blue symbols indicate lakes that were formerly larger than 250 square kilometers. Given that we are in the UN Decade for Ecosystem Race Restoration right now, um, 2020 to 2030, insights on ecosystem restoration from the Aral Sea region should be shared more broadly. Ecosystem restoration, as I mentioned before, can help build resilience, helping people to stay in their places, even as climate changes. And then my final point. So the Aral Sea is often sensationalized. For example, the latest New York Times opinion essay, which described it as hell. So the Aral Sea has been the poster child, as we've talked about, for environmental catastrophe. However, I would argue that this catastrophic thinking does not really help create meaningful change, but leads people to become overwhelmed and then causes paralysis. So from the outside, the Aral Sea catastrophe seems to be just too big to do anything about. This catastrophic thinking can also lead for a, a search for a magic bullet or one size fits all solution, but these rarely, if ever, exist and can divert resources from supporting existing local initiatives. So when I think about seeing beyond catastrophe, I see the most remarkable change in the Aral Sea region coming from local small scale initiatives. Importantly, these are focused off the seabed and where people actually live. And in my the examples here in the Amudario Delta. So this includes uh, the success of the Bukhara deer um, population restoration in the lower Amudario Biosphere Reserve. Um, you can see that, that red arrow points to the, the deer hiding in the woods. Um, small, uh, crop rotation to include uh, improved soil health. In Uzbekistan, they're using a lot of mung beans uh, in rotation with cotton and cotton and wheat. Um, small business enterprises, including food storage and processing that can help improve nutrition in this region. This is a traditional melon storage facility that uses almost no electricity, just occasional fans for ventilation uh, and will allow melons to be stored um, for an additional three months or more. And finally, the careful tending of home gardens and aquaculture ponds. So climate change is so big that it also leads to this kind of paralysis. So here too, we need to see beyond catastrophe, I argue, to make change. And in this, we can learn from Aral Sea residents. So I think that we need to better document, listen, and share the stories of Aral Sea residents, especially those who've lived through this entire change, so that we can better understand their persistence uh, in place and their small and powerful acts of change. So as we move forward, both with climate change adaptation and environmental restoration in the Aral Sea region and beyond, we must center the desired futures of these residents, those who live and persist in these places. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to discuss a very timely and important topic, the present and the future of the Aral Sea. My fellow panelists have already provided a good analysis about this body of water, including projects carried out by Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. It's in the interest of not being repetitive, and because my fellow panelists have already covered this topic much more comprehensively and efficiently than I could, my presentation will have a different angle. Typically, I will discuss the RLC in a regional and geopolitical context, mentioning more relevant factors and prices to keep in mind. In order to look to the future, we have to think about the recent past. We have to think about the New York Declaration, signed during the historic meeting between U.S. President Joe Biden and the five Central Asian presidents, the United Nations General Assembly in New York in September. This declaration will serve as the blueprint for the future of U.S. Central Asia relations. The declaration, is, the declaration is important to highlight because it has an environmental chapter. Specifically, the declaration calls for, and I quote, enhancing Central Asia's water security and environmental quality, 
working to increase the regional cooperation on water and ecological issues that take into account food security, sanitation, agriculture, and energy sector li linkages. Be it the USAID's regional water and environment vulnerable environment program, we plan to collaborate to address water, energy, food, and environmental needs to simultaneously combat climate change, end quote. In other words, there's already a framework for continuous U.S. Central Asia engagement regarding environmental issues, water security, and climate change. Now, let's take a brief detour. Central Asian policymakers, scholars, and analysts hope that U.S. engagement with Central Asia will continue after the 5 plus 1 presidential summit. So far, some high-profile visits have occurred. In October, USC director, USAID director Samantha Power visited Uzbekistan to participate in the C5 plus 1 regional connectivity ministerial to discuss, and I quote from a press release from the State Department, to discuss concrete actions on inclusive, sustainable economic development in the region. Then in November, just last month, Assistant Secretary of State for the Bureau of, C of South, Centra South and Central Asian Affairs, Donald Liu, visited Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan to participate in the U.S.-Kazakhstan Enhanced Strategic Partnership Dialogue and the U.S.-Uzbekistan Strategic Partnership Dialogue, respectively. Looking to the future, the next milestone will occur next March in Almaty, Kazakhstan. The, net, the first ever Business Park Plus One will take place in Kazakhstan business capital. The summit's goals are to promote economic security via, among others, promoting innovation and foreign investment. This hope that more U.S. companies, not just industries that work on mining and energy mm -hmm. issues, will be interested in opening offices, hubs, and facilities across Central Asia. One great example is Honeywell which opened a manufacturing facility in Almaty last July 2022. So to summarize, we've had so far a presidential 5 plus 1, a C5 plus 1 regional connectivity ministerial, and next year there will be a business 5 plus 1. What's next? In late November, I published an article for e-international relations recommending what summit, which I'm calling a green 5 plus 1. To summarize, I propose that John Kerry, the special a special presidential envoy for the environment to visit Central Asia, for example, Aston, and new environmental ministers and agencies from the region to discuss the RLC and the region's other environmental challenges. This type of meeting has already happened before, but only once and virtually. In 2021, during the COVID pandemic, special envoy Kerry and his Central Asian peers met virtually to discuss environmental issues. Now, what I propose is for such a meeting to occur in person in situ. The Green 5 plus 1 could occur under the umbrella of the New York Declaration, which, as we have discussed, mentions environmental issues, water security, and climate change. Moreover, if a, if a Green 5 plus 1 summit occurs in 2024, this meeting will continue the momentum started by, by, the, presidential, by the presidential 5 plus 1 summit in uh, September, the upcoming Business 5 plus 1. And that's a place where the U.S. task force, uh, the U.S. Kazakhstan task force launch, uh, task force could be launched uh, as, as part of this summit if it occurs. Diversifying the areas for interaction and cooperation between Washington and Central Asia will make the partnership more dynamic and stronger. Moreover, as I mentioned in my article, environmental cooperation is a low stakes issue that neighboring states like Russia and China will ideally not see as threatening to their own relationship with Central Asia. Now I want to say a word about COP28. As, uh, as, as, the, as the representative from the Kazakhstan embassy has already said, in his remarks at the, during the climate summit at the, in the United Arab Emirates, Kazakhstani President Kassim Yomar Tokayev made a, very, made, made a very relevant statement. First, he called for more funds to be allocated to support international funds for saving the RLC. He mentioned that Kazakhstan will take over chairmanship of the fund next year. He also mentioned that Kazakhstan and France will co-chair the first ever One Water Summit in 2024 at the, UN, at the United Nations General Assembly in New York, where I assume the, general, the RLC will be discussed. And finally, Kazakhstan, uh, the Kazakhstani president invited member states to the Stana International Forum in June 2024. For those in the audience that are not aware, the Stana International, the Stana International Forum is a type of platform for dialogue and cope about international affairs that the government of Kazakhstan has organized since around 2008. I wrote my article for international relations before President Tokayev made his speech at COP28. 
So the Green 5 plus 1 summit that I'm proposing could occur during the Astana International Forum next year. I do believe in a, the high level meeting to discuss the RLC, not only between Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, but with all international partners and relevant agencies, like the International Fund for Saving the RLC and the United States, is necessary to have an honest discussion, honest and comprehensive discussion about what is the status of the RLC, the prospect for future healing or restoration or rehabilitation, and which projects need to be prioritized or canceled. Organizing this type of conference, perhaps as part of the Stan International Forum, under the umbrella of the New York De Declaration, with the participation of Special Envoy Kerry and USA Director Samantha Power, will also help, as I've mentioned, maintain high-level US engagement in Central Asia after the presidential set 5 plus 1. Now, I am short on time, but I want to quickly stress that water-related crises have become quite prevalent across Central Asia and beyond. Some crises have been turned violent. For example, in 2021, 2022, there were clashes between Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan along the Comor border over water access to water sources. Moreover, the RLC is not the only sea that Kazakhstan borders. The other one is the Caspian Sea, which has five littoral states, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, Iran, Russia, and Turkmenistan. Analysts and scholars who monitor the Central Sea, the Central, Central Asia and the Caucasus, know well the importance of the Caspian Sea, which boils, links these two regions. I think they gave some other bodies of water in the region, the Caspian is also under threat. Scientific research shows that the water levels of the sea have gone down in recent years, and islands are beginning to appear. And here you can see some photos from NASA about the shrinking coastline of the Caspian, much like the Aral, over, over, the, past, over the past two decades. It's from 2006, this one's from 2023. The Caspian also suffers from illegal fishing, overfishing, pollution, and contamination. Now, I am aware that Uzbekistan does not border the Caspian Sea. It's true, but the Caspian's health is also important to Uzbekistan's future development. Since the beginning of the uh, war in Ukraine, the Transcaspian International Transport Route, commonly known as the Middle Corridor, has become very relevant for the transportation of goods from Central Asia to Europe and the international market by bypassing Russian territory. The, the Russian Middle Corridor's members, the members of the Middle Corridor, I'm sorry, are Azerbaijan, Georgia, Kazakhstan, and Turkey. However, companies from other countries, including Uzbekistan, are already using the corridor to export their goods to Europe. Hence, the health of the Caspian Sea is of utmost importance for the Middle Corridor states and also non-corridor states like Uzbekistan. In 2003, the five Caspian states ratified the Tehran Convention, meant to protect the Caspian's health. In 2018, the five Caspian states also signed a convention in Aktau, Kazakhstan, to solve a border dispute between the, the five states. Unfortunately, the two documents have not been utilized effectively to protect the Caspian's environment, including its water levels. And as a final example, there's a similar problem uh, not far from Central Asia, specifically in northwestern Iran. Lake Urmia, the largest lake in the Middle East, has been drying up for years due to severe water mismanagement by the Iranian government and due to climate change. And finally, it's necessary to mention that these environmental challenges, including saving or healing what is left in the RLC, will, not be, will become more challenging because of climate change. Droughts, for example, will become more extreme, more extreme and destructive. Central Asia suffered a drought in as recently as 2021. Agricultural land and thousands of cattle were lost. If you want to save the RLC, we have to protect water levels, which means addressing climate change as it will exacerbate natural disasters like droughts. I am aware that my analysis covered issues past the RLC's borders. So in my, in, my brief, in my brief conclusions, let me bring the discussion back to the topic at hand. The RLC is a terrible human-made disaster. However, the RLC crisis is just one of several water-related crises that Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, other Central Asian and Caucasus nations have to address. Long-term environmental strategies are required to handle these water-related challenges simultaneously, not one by one. A Green 5 plus 1 summit under the umbrella of the New York Declaration is advisable to maintain the momentum between the United States and Central Asia and to develop new what joint projects towards healing or restoring the RLC and to discuss all environmental challenges that must be addressed today, not tomorrow. Finally, the relevant authorities should consider organizing this type of meeting under the umbrella of the Stan International Forum or at or and or 
also at the One Water Summit at the United Nations General Assembly next year. Thank you. Спасибо. First of all, I would like to say that, uh, uh, as it was uh, already uh, said by other speakers, by the previous speakers, I can say that IFAS is uh, um, ha having their 30 years anniversary, and uh, yes. Международный фонд спасения Орала – это платформа, которая связывает страны Центральной Азии. The National Fund for Saving the RLC is a kind of platform that unites uh, Central Asian states together. Да, пред, предыдущие спикеры тоже говорили о том, что в этом году председательство МФСА перешло в Душамбе в Казахстану, и с 24 -го года мы начнем активно работать уже как председатель фонда спасения Орала. И президентом нашего фонда является президент Казахстана Космос Жумар Токаев. Uh, noted that uh, in Dushanbe it was uh, passed to Kazakhstan. The chairmanship in International Fund for Saving the RLC were passed to Kazakhstan, and our president will be the chair of the International Fund for Saving the RLC in 2024. <laughs> Основной целью является эта практическая помощь как в водохозяйственной деятельности, так и в социально-экономических, экологических проблемах в регионе Аральского моря с казахстанской части. And as you can see on the slide, uh, our main objectives are to uh, related to the water management issues, also as uh, social economical uh, issues and uh, environmental issues on the in, in the Kazakhstani part. Большое спасибо нашему исследователю историку Сари, который до меня уже рассказала тех работах, которые о тех практических действиях, которые произошли у нас в регионе. Поэтому я бы не хотела на этом останавливаться. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. I would like to thank Sara, the previous speaker, for telling, sharing our practical actions that we made. In, the, in in our country, and I I don't want to repeat her, so I will uh, go uh, forward. И я очень согласна с Сарой, которая говорит о том, что мы не можем говорить о восстановлении, а мы должны говорить там, о реабилитации. Сара в этом плане согласна. И также я согласна с Катей. Кэт, который сказала о том, что населению приорали вот, не так уж много надо, чтобы они ощущали себя счастливыми. А для счастья это, конечно, это та вода и та обстановка, которая будет вот, создается и будет создана вокруг них. И одна из самых главных проблем это, конечно, последствия Аральского моря. I totally agree with the uh, previous speakers, uh, with Sara, who said that uh, uh, we cannot uh, actually talk about the restoration of the water body. We can rather uh, use uh, the term rehabilitation, which is true. And with uh, Kate as well, I would like to agree with her because she said that uh, the happiness of the local uh, uh, population, local people, is that uh, uh, 
they can uh, make uh, small steps, small uh, changes in this in this area. And I would like to say also that uh, the water issue is very crucial, and uh, their happiness can uh, can be dependent on the availability of water resources. And uh, another big issue is the salt uh, and dust removals uh, from the seabed. Правительством Казахстана принимаются очень большие работы по реабилитации. Это вот называется программа бассейна Аральского моря, которая утверждена нашим правительством. The government of Kazakhstan are providing a lot of uh, activities uh, from uh, their side. Uh, for example, the RLC basin program, which is which was signed by the government as well. И эта программа бассейна Аральского моря до 30 -го года в первую очередь предусматривает улучшение жизни населения, проживающего в этом регионе. And this program, which is uh, uh, called ASBP, uh, first of all, uh, it is considered to be implemented uh, uh, up till uh, 2030, uh, and the first, uh, the most important uh, objective in this program is the improvement of the social uh, social um, status of the local people. Но тем не менее мы понимаем, что мы до сих пор опираемся на помощь наших международных организаций, фондов. Поэтому я вообще сегодня в восторге от сегодняшнего наш, нашей вот этой конференции, которая вот в таком вот аспекте проходит, когда искренне чувствуется, что люди хотят помочь региону Аральского моря, и хотят помочь и работают непосредственно там. Это я в частности хочу отметить и Сару, и Кейт, и вот наш президент на последнем саммите Дубая призвал международные организации к финансированию экологических проблем, климатических проблем Аральского моря. But in any case, uh, the, I would like to, uh, to emphasize that international organization from this conference, uh, the participants uh, of this of this conference are willing to help uh, our reach our they are very worried about our issues and uh, people like Sarah and Kate are uh, actually physically participating and uh, visiting uh, our regions which is very uh, good and i would like to say that our president Kasim Jomar Tokayev also emphasized that we need to increase the funding of the uh, International Fund for Saving the RLC. И как я уже сказал, одна из самых главных проблем, которые у нас есть, кроме того, что нам у нас большие проблемы с водой, у нас еще вот это осушенное дно Аральского моря, которое мы так называем, оно у нас является местом, откуда выходят огромные тонны соли и пыли. A uh, main uh, issue of ours is that uh, the what we call the dried seabed of the RLC. Uh, it uh, has it is like a source of uh, tons of uh, salt and dust removals. Если после восстановления Кугаральской дамбы к нам пришла вода, так называемая Северное Аральское море, и вместе с ним начало развиваться рыбное хозяйство, то нам приходится очень много средств, финансовых, человеческих ресурсов применять там, чтобы осушенное дно засадить местными породами деревьев. Or the North Aral Sea Dam, we have uh, uh, rehabilitated this uh, North Aral Sea 
part of the RLC, the smaller water body, and also it uh, led to the rehabilitation of the fishery industry as well. Also, we are uh, focused on the development of the plantations and crops on, on in the area. Союзом Нексус Диалог, где мы э, начали применять э, новые технологии в улучшении приживаемости э, деревьев на осушенном дне, потому что э, приживаемость на соленых почвах – это очень тяжелый процесс. Uh, on the uh, on behalf of the European Union, we have uh, we have this uh, Nexus Dialogue project or program that is uh, uh, which uh, main uh, objective is to improve the uh, survival rate of the plantations that we are uh, setting in the area. Как вы видите на фотографии наглядно. Вот Нексус Диалог, и вот вы видите, как из ведра поливают. Это саксаул, который выращивают специально применением технологий закрытой корневой системы, когда саксаул высаживается в специальных контейнерах. Uh, we we have we used uh, a closed root system in in this plant uh, while planting this saxo uh, один из уникальных проектов который мы продолжили это проект совместно с проект юсаид Zavoresh, I'm so sorry. Can you try to wrap up in two minutes? That was I, I, continued. Uh, because of our technical, technical, technological issues, but we have one more speaker. I'm so sorry. Да, один из лучших проектов, который мы проводим, это проект USAID, который, я думаю, применяется все новые технологии, и мы думаем, что этот проект будет уникальным среди всех проектов, которые проходят, потому что впервые на казахстанской части Аральского моря пробурена скважина на глубине 500 метров. И это дает очень большой такую нам ну, как бы причину того, что здесь сексаул будет лучше расти. Uh, another unique project of ours is the USAID uh, project, uh, which is using all the new technologies in uh, plantation uh, of saxaul uh, saxaul trees. And uh, the, in this project, what happened is that uh, it was the first time when in, in the Kazakhstani part of the RLC seabed, former seabed, uh, we drilled a uh, well uh, with the of 500 uh, meters uh, deep uh, well. Yeah, перед тем как закончить, хочу обратить внимание всех участников этой конференции на вот эту фотографию. Это есть как раз то, что мы называем осушенным дном Аральского моря. И вот представьте, вот что значит осталось нам после Аральского моря. Абсолютная пустошь солью и песком. Uh, at the end, uh, before finishing my uh, speech, my presentation, I would like to draw your attention to these pictures uh, on the on the on the screen uh, that shows uh, that what uh, left after uh, after the RLC. Кто бы мог себе представить, что когда-то на Аральском море вот так будет борозить трактор и делать борозды? Who could have uh, thought that uh, after many years uh, there will be a tractor uh, uh, making furrows on the on the seabed like this, like on this picture? Да, вот несколько фотографий. Большое спасибо. Извините, что отняла ваше время. Ну, вот.
важно, которые мы пробурили. Большое спасибо за внимание. Uh, here are some several photographs. Take a look, and uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I would like to apologize for taking the time. And uh, this is the well I was talking about. So in the interest of time, I'll try to be really, really brief um, and, and just share a couple points and a couple slides. Um, so first of all, um, I want to say thank you for having me here at the table today. Um, I, I think that um, archaeologists often do not contribute um, to some of these contemporary conversations, and I'm pleased um, that we have the opportunity to do so because I think that um, archaeologists are in a good position to answer some natural questions that we have, um, some common questions that come up about uh, when we see sustainability problems, when we see crises like the Aral Sea, um, whether and to what extent people have experienced this in the past, and then a natural question as to whether and what uh, we can learn from those ancient past experiences. So I will say um, I have worked in, largely in collaboration with the Institute of the Humanities of the Care Colpac branch of the Academy of Sciences in NUKU since around 2005, so off and on for the last 20 years. And a lot of my understanding and data about the ancient past of the Aral Sea Basin, its archaeology, comes from that region and that perspective in northwestern Uzbekistan. But I'll try to speak more comprehensively um, in thinking about, in particular, Sarah's points about the transboundary nature of these questions, thinking uh, more broadly about the archaeology. So, um, as to the question of whether people have experienced this in the past, um, and if so, what we can learn from their past experiences, uh, we've already heard a bit, um, and thank you to my colleagues for, for sharing about this, that indeed, yes, um, the recession uh, of the Aral Sea that we see today, uh, while it is um, on an order of magnitude more extreme and the climate changes we're facing in the future are more extreme, it is in fact uh, not new. And I'll share really quickly here. Um, uh, I think it's helpful to have an image uh, in our minds. Can everyone see that? Yes? Can we see the, my slides all right, Sebastian and others? Yes. Okay. So, um, and this is again um, a little bit. This is from 2000. So the piece mark there is the future, uh, the present, uh, and the future already looks uh, different. But indeed, um, the Aral Sea um, has receded in the past. There's a great deal of uh, scientific evidence. Uh, for this uh, that has studied Aral Sea lake level changes in geologic history. And a lot of that data um, and those studies have specifically focused on the Holocene, which is the last 10,000 years when we see uh, agriculture and human societies develop. So the Aral Sea has had different phases and shapes across time. Um, and the scientific studies that have been done excuse me, without getting too much into the details of them, have also specifically addressed questions of whether and to what extent these changes have been caused by natural factors, specifically climate change, uh, as well as river change that, that occurs naturally in this very dynamic basin, um, uh, and to what degree anthropogenic impacts or human impacts um, have been a factor in Aral Sea changes in the past. Um, these studies include numerous different kinds of measures, some of which my colleague Kate Shields showed uh, earlier, um, which include uh, sediment and geologic landscape analyses of lake shores and terraces of the Aral Sea, uh, corings from the Aral Sea bed, which give all kinds of paleoenvironmental proxies to give you some of those salinity measures that were shown. Uh, and archaeology itself has also played a role in understanding the sea's uh, various shapes across time, uh, where we see settlements in places um, that gives us a sense of where the sea uh, regressed and transgressed across human history. So what does this science tell us about past Aral Sea uh, regressions and transgressions? Um, in terms of irrigation agriculture and its impacts, probably, and this is still a bit up for uh, debate, but probably around 2,500 years ago, beginning the Iron Age, uh, it may be that human irrigation practices were impacting uh, the Aral Sea. Um, certainly within the last thousand years in the medieval uh, recession at a period called the medieval climate optimum when we see uh, climate changes um, somewhat comparable to today and through uh, quantitative modeling of the water withdrawals of irrigation. And here I'd, I'd refer specifically to some uh, recent very good studies by Renato Sala. Um, when we quantify the water withdrawals 
uh, or when that has been done, uh, it is clear that um, uh, irrigation agriculture uh, did impact uh, the Aral Sea, at least um, in the medieval period and maybe earlier. And so it is generally accepted amongst these scientific studies uh, today that indeed uh, Aral Sea changes um, uh, ha have natural factors, climate change and river movement, um, but they these are in addition amplified by anthropogenic change, specifically irrigation practices uh, in the ancient and medieval past. So uh, indeed we can start to think about um, uh, past Aral Sea regressions and human impacts um, and the question then as to whether uh, and how humans in the past dealt with this. And this is where um, some um, archeological knowledge can help us to think through uh, practices and means by which uh, human societies may be dealt with these issues, how they built resiliency, how they understood sustainability through their practices. Um, so I'll just real briefly, I want to share a little bit of what archaeology might be able to tell us in those areas, but I say that with a couple caveats, um, because archaeology can tell us um, how humans in the past adapted to aerial sea changes in sustainable ways, but there are certain things that the information can and cannot do for us. And so um, based on uh, um, other case studies where archaeological knowledge has been directly applied to sustainability problems and challenges, we know there are a couple difficulties and pitfalls with that. So we need to think about archaeological insights and data on past uh, Aral Sea crises or recessions um, as things that can give us some guidance or insight, but they're not necessarily prescriptive solutions that can be directly applied to the modern context. Uh, there's a number of reasons for this. Uh, global agricultural systems are um, not what they were in the past. There are a lot of external parameters and pressures, um, global markets and trade, um, labor that affects farmer level, um, farm level decision making by farmers about how they invest in their agriculture. Um, ancient peoples also weren't necessarily more in tune with their environment than we are today. They also um, uh, did, had things they knew and didn't know and, and um, could fail uh, in their systems. Um, and then lastly, there's a lot of limitations to archeological data in terms of the resolution that we were able to see on the ground. Um, the nature of the archeological record is also fragmentary. So there are places where we uh, can see and know things from the archeological record and a lot of holes as well. And then finally, um, our interpretations vary. Um, but to tell uh, specifically about some of the things that are in the archeological toolkit, if you were, what archaeology can share with us about how people have uh, experienced and adapted to uh, aerial sea changes in the past and things that might be useful in thinking about the current crises that are faced in the region. Um, first of all, thinking about cyclical impacts and time scales when we look at the development of irrigation agriculture in places like the Amu Darya Delta and Sir Darya Delta across time, we could perhaps uh, very generally say there's a sort of cyclical impact of um, agricultural systems that seem to last on the range of 800 to 900 years, depending on how you count it before major changes and collapses are encountered. So the Iron Age period, maybe we're looking at around 900 years of uh, uh, extensive agricultural, uh, irrigation agricultural development in the medieval period. Um, maybe around 800 years, but with a lot of things sort of happening in those time frames. Um, the other things uh, that we can look at from the archaeological record uh, that are helpful is thinking about the agricultural systems that existed in the past and what those may have provided in response to major hydrological changes. Uh, and the first thing that I'll emphasize there um, is that when we talk about ancient agricultural systems in much of Central Asia, um, and I think this is particularly true in the lower uh, Amu Darya Delta, we're not necessarily, even where we have extensive development of irrigation canals, um, drainage systems. Um, we're not necessarily in all cases talking about intensive agriculture everywhere, but rather we tend to, as archaeologists, talk about a, a more diverse agro-pastoralism in which irrigation agriculture is integrated with um, and it co-occurs with uh, different forms of pastoralism, including pastoralists who may be engaged in um, uh, wetland ecosystem uh, farming, uh, rain-fed agriculture in different places. In the medieval period, we even see sort of the restoration of wetlands um, and lakes uh, for exploitation through drainage canals. And so there's an integrated uh, system of sort of patchiness between agriculture uh, and pastoralism, which involves a lot of different 
um, techniques um, uh, and different kinds of cropping mechanisms that may uh, provide some um, resiliency to uh, repeated experiences of low level water changes and variability in um, smaller lake beds and streams, uh, things like um, uh, agriculture of melon crops, which you can grow on top years through uh, rain harvesting, ra uh, rainwater farming, uh, different techniques which uh, allow you to use movable water, moving water in different ways. Um, another thing that archaeology might uh, uh, share with us uh, that we can think about and which is talked about in terms of applying archaeology in questions of sustainability are things like orphan crops, what are called orphan crops, crops which were really prevalent in the ancient past, which we don't tend to see in food regimes as much today. Um, one of these, which I'll highlight, is millet. Um, both foxtail and broomcorn millet, which we see um, coming in in the second millennium BC uh, across um, all of Central Asia and has differential impacts in different places. Millet's a really important crop because it has a real short growing season right at the height of summer cultivation. You can integrate uh, millet with um, low investment forms of agriculture um, and it provides high yields both for animals uh, and people. Um, there's also legume agriculture that we uh, might think about as well. Legumes are important nitrogen fixers, um, and they're not uh, as extensively developed in a lot of the agriculture in the Aral Sea Basin today, um, but some legumes were important in the past. In particular, grass pea uh, or lathyris is something that we see coming again and again in archaeological contexts, and so there's some questions to be asked about whether those crops might be something that are useful to think about. Again, um, and this is where uh, we don't necessarily want to be prescriptive with the archaeological past. Um, there are a lot of reasons why um, farmers make decisions about what to grow and people make decisions about what to eat and what to feed their animals. But thinking through um, some of what those past orphan crops might uh, provide in integrated uh, diverse systems um, might be useful to thinking about uh, broader resiliency in the face of change. Um, and then last couple of things that I think are worthwhile um, from the archaeological record to think about um, are other combinations of drought and salt tolerant crops that we see come up at particular times, especially in times of um, more kind of region level stress as water system changes. Um, combinations of millet, cotton, rice, and sorghum, these are all drought tolerant crops. Um, also salt tolerant crops. We tend to think about cotton and rice in the modern context as very um, water intensive and um, uh, utilizing a lot of resources, um, but they're also very salt tolerant. Rice, though it takes a lot of water, can be um, grown in, in contexts um, that are otherwise sort of waterlogged. Um, and so seeing those things co-occurring uh, might give us some indicators about um, how we uh, people in the past have dealt with stress through their cropping regimes and rotations and how we might um, today. And then the last piece of sort of water technology that I think is getting a, a lot more attention from the archaeological record and people are starting to talk about a bit more um, are underground channels which surface um, uh, groundwater for human use, um, in particular the Connaughts, which are a kind of underground tunnel. Um, these are prevalent in eastern Iran more than Central Asia, although they do occur in certain places in Central Asia in the Aral Sea Basin um, as means to uh, make use of groundwater resources. But I would encourage um, us to think um, and thinking about the kinds of research from archaeology that we might pursue that might be relevant to the modern case. Uh, more broadly in Central Asia, we can talk about Karez, um, which are um, much more diverse and varied than, than the Eastern Iranian Kanats, um, and which are systems of underground tapping of the aquifer, uh, wells, sometimes with tunnels and sometimes not, but which not only surface groundwater, uh, but are also uh, perhaps systems that had been used previously to replenish and maintain groundwater resources. So um, I think there's a lot more research that needs to be done on those systems to understand how they functioned in the ancient past, but it's a, a worthwhile point um, to be thinking about. Uh, there's a lot of attention, of course, to surface water and surface water impacts on the Aral Sea Basin, um, but the groundwater and groundwater management um, I think are, are lessons that we can also pull from the archeological past to be thinking about in our development uh, planning today. So 
Uh, I hope I didn't take too much of a, the time. I know we're a little over. I'll stop there and um, let you have the floor back. Uh, I was wondering what would be, uh, I mean, there are plenty of stakeholders engaged in uh, fixing or trying to work to fix uh, the RLC issue as this kind of big ecological, I mean, environmental issues. I was wondering what would be, what are actually the main roles and the contributions of civil society? Uh, I mean, including media, including, of course, CSOs, or even academia in supporting and fostering its development and the resilience of uh, the RLC region and also of its people. I mean, how can these actors, these stakeholders be more uh, effectively engaged uh, to participate uh, in uh, the decision making and implementation processes related to the RLC issue? Anyone wants to answer? I'll give one just a quick stab. When it comes to the um, to the stakeholders, that's something that I have thought about, not just about the RLC, but other environmental crisis in the world, is that there's, there's an expression in, the, in English where, it's, where it goes something like, there can be too many cooks in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. And I think that may be the case in the RLC too, where you have the USAID, you have the World Bank, you have the European Union, you have local, uh, local, the local uh, governments, the, you have the, the organization like the one we just talked to, uh, the, the RLC that was created between Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. So I think that's another reason why maybe I'm gonna promote my own idea of the Green Five Plus One Summit. It's just, it's just like a summit for, for all these stakeholders to just really come to one, in one place and say, okay, what's working, what's not? Are we overlapping each other? Are we like doing the same projects in different parts of the RLC and it's just not really working? Should we just pull our resources towards specific projects? So I think that's, that I think a meeting like that is necessary uh, when it comes to international stakeholders to also have a discussion with local stakeholders, local population, and simply say, okay, what have we done in the past 20 years, in the past 30 years that has worked and what has not? That'll be a, my, my, my opinion. Thank you. Um, I think I will just second that opinion. When uh, I first started working on the RLC and still actually now I became a little bit overwhelmed by what I might even call the like alphabet soup of acronyms of yeah. all these organizations that were working on the RLC. My goodness, like if you were just to list it off the number of groups, right? Uh, USAID, UN, um, UNDP, the Japanese government. Um, I mean, we could, uh, the, the Danish government has also been involved, Doctors Without Borders, right? We could go on. Um, and so I actually attended um, in, I believe it was May in Kazorda, I attended a uh, donor coordination conference, actually, which was an attempt to bring actually a lot of these stakeholders and organizations together to talk to each other. And I think that was a really valuable uh, experience because, of course, knowledge uh, sharing needs to go on. Of course, as has already been raised, um, we need um, knowledge sharing not only amongst these different organizations, but across national borders, right? Um, you know, it's a, it's a transboundary um, issue. I've been really impressed by uh, the work that I've seen civil society organizations do, um, particularly because the region is so vast, you really need these local organizations on the ground. I mean, just as an example, to get out from like Aralsk to some of the surrounding villages, um, these are trips sometimes of you know five hours by four wheel drive vehicle. So it's really important to have these groups on the ground. Um, and in terms of the media, I think, more has to be done to correct some of the pervasive stereotypes that are out there actually about um, the RLC. My colleagues have, have already spoken to this, but um, to, and, and I think um, uh, Kate did a wonderful job of, of stressing it as a place that people live and people really want to stay in, uh, not as uh, necessarily as a zone of uh, catastrophe. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, I mean, sorry. Yeah, yeah, sure, of course. Just briefly add some comments. Uh, yeah, it's essential, uh, the engagement of major stakeholders. They, we talked about a lot of about their role, uh, but frankly speaking, everything uh, is matters. Of course, the improving legislation norms, uh, engagement of uh, the development institutions. But frankly speaking, is more funds needed, more financial resources are required. And just uh, to provide you with some figures uh, when we talk about the financial resources. Uh, for example, of course, we see the uh, growing role of 
uh, major oil companies in this field in tackling the climate issues. Uh, but we would like to see more proactive uh, engagement, not only uh, from our uh, Kazakh companies, but also from the American companies, including Chevron and Exxon. Uh, for instance, one fifth of Chevron's revenue last year comes from Kazakhstan, comes from TCO project. And of course, we would like to see comparable engagement between the revenues and spendings related to the addressing climate issues. And of course, uh, the probably uh, the best indicator, one of the best indicators of, the, uh, of that depicting that we are tackling the, uh, struggling this problem uh, is a growing number of people returning to the region. Of course, it's uh, based on all of these aspects, I think that we can achieve common grounds and achieve our goals on addressing those issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just want to take one uh, more and last question from uh, our audience who hasn't been well treated today with our technological issues. So the question is, what kind of action has been taken for the people's health care? I mean, people inhale the leftover toxins from the sea, they get sick, and uh, infant mortality is pretty high in the Karakan like, region. So uh, yes, what kind of action has been taken to to help, I mean, to treat this uh, health care? Um, this was actually the original goal of my my research, and for various reasons, I didn't didn't tackle it as much as I wanted to. Um, but I think that there's several aspects to the what's being done for people's health. So in the on the and I can speak more to this Uzbekistan side of the RLC. Um, there is so Doctors Without Borders has had a long term mission there for more than twenty years. One of the major issues that they've been tackling is tuberculosis, um, which is exacerbated, of course, by you know it's a respiratory disease exacerbated by dust and things. Um, so they've been working with with people on that. What they've found increasingly is one of the major health issues in the region is diabetes. Um, which they say, um, which I was told, I you know expected them actually to say, oh, the the dust is the the biggest problem. And what they said is that, um, the dust is a is is related to um, sort of the ways the the lack of water um, when you get to the far north, um, right below the Aral Sea region, uh, and that the the biggest challenges come from lack of fruit, fruit and veg, um, and healthy protein, including fish. Um, and so that people, you know, used to have lots of gardens that they were growing, they were growing tomatoes and cucumbers and grapes and things like that had lots of fruit trees, and that those have not have been dying because of intermittent water supplies. So people are less able to self provision with healthy foods. And so um, chronic diseases like diabetes have been um, getting higher. So as we think about uh, future health interventions, um, so the uh, there's some work being done on school diets. Um, Mercy Corps in Uzbekistan has been working on school health and nutrition um, with school children in um, the RLC region. But I think as we think about it, thinking uh, beyond just the direct consequences of the dust and thinking more broadly about, about nutrition and um, gardening and fish is really important to think about health. I'll just share on the, the previous question about how we move forward and what needs to happen. Um, I think one of the things that we should have our eyes on are um, a, a greater number of scientists who can speak um, to the public um, and to share what is often very complex, complicated and conflicting uh, data in ways that uh, communicate um, the value of the science to understanding the nature of the problems. Um, and specifically to that, I will say that I think that there needs to be much further um, uh, capacity development within, uh, speaking mostly to Uzbekistan, but it, to the Aral Sea Basin countries in terms of supporting researchers uh, within those countries to develop the environmental sciences skills to be able uh, to do that work. Often what we see, particularly in archaeology, is that we come in on collaborative projects, but a lot of the laboratory uh, work that we do requires working in facilities outside uh, of the Aral Sea Basin. And the more we can build research capacities within the countries uh, to do that, the more we have people on the ground who can speak to both the uh, experiences of living in those environments as well as what the science can tell us about them. 
All right, so I think we unfortunately really need to conclude. Uh, so I would like to thank first all our speakers for their great presentations. Uh, I would like to thank the Embassy of Kazakhstan, Mr. Stelulin. Thank you for being here, for having organized this event. Again, we really, really apologize for all the technical issues we had from the very beginning. I mean, we look forward to having you again in our upcoming seminars, but without technological issues, we promise. Yes. So thank you very much and have a nice day. Thank you. Bye.